Chapter 11. Now that we know that DNA is the genetic material that's going to code for the proteins in the cell, we also know how DNA gets copied um, or replicated. Now we're going to move on and talk about how the DNA actually is used as that code. So we're going to talk about how DNA first gets turned into RNA. That procedure is called transcription. Again, enzymes are going to be responsible for that. We'll go through all that detail. Um, RNA in eukaryotic cells undergoes processing. We'll explain what that processing is that happens inside the nucleus. Then the RNA leaves the nucleus through a pore, and then it gets um, found by the two ribosome subunits which um, attach to it, and then translate it and make it into a protein. We'll talk a little bit about how proteins get um, post-translationally modified, and um, that's pretty much it. We'll have a little discussion about mutations in here too. So the enzyme that's going to copy our DNA and make it into RNA is called RNA polymerase. Not too much of a surprise. Um, there's a couple different kinds of RNA polymerases, and um, we're not going to get into those details, but just know that there's, there's multiple ones. RNA polymerase is a protein, so you notice your alpha helices. Got some beta pleated sheet thing going on here. A lot of alpha helices. The other features that you can see in this crystallization representation is the DNA is in blue. You can kind of make out that double helix. You can see that RNA polymerase is able to split those hydrogen bonds and break it apart and then use one copy, one side of the DNA as the template to match the RNA nucleotides um, that are complementary. And that all happens in this groove. The growing RNA chain leaves. DNA is going to get put back together. So three steps involved in transcribing RNA or DNA to RNA is first initiation. We'll look at these in a little more detail as we uh, get more pictures. Then there's elongation and then there's termination. Basically you have to find the gene that you want to tra transcribe. You need to transcribe it and then you need to pop off and go away. Again, this is all mediated by RNA polymerase. Not sure why I put this again, but there you go. That's what's going to happen. And let's focus in on the initiation part. So um, initiation is when the RNA polymerase finds the correct location on the DNA that it needs to copy. It's going to unwind the DNA and separate it. There's a special part of the um, DNA sequence called the promoter. The promoter is basically a sequence of DNA nucleotides. You can see them highlighted in red here. It's going to be different for every gene. And that promoter region is going to attract, in fact, I need to have another slide in here. That promoter region is going to attract um, some special proteins to bring that RNA polymerase in here and know that this is a gene that should be made at any particular time. We'll actually get to this in the next chapter, so I'm not going to go dig for that extra slide. Basically, the promoter binds several different things. The promoter binds um, some transcription factors or proteins that are specific for whatever this gene happens to be. You don't want all your genes going and being made at the same time. Um, sometimes you do need them at the same time, but sometimes you're picking and choosing which ones you're going to make, and that's the topic of the next chapter, I believe, so we'll go into that later. Uh, another feature about the promoter is called the TATA box, T-A-T-A, -A, and T-A-T-A -T -A always exists in this promoter region. It's just something that the RNA polymerase is always looking for. Okay, so that's initiation, finding the gene that you're going to copy. Um, then elongation is basically the RNA polymerase processing down, separating the DNA, bringing in those nucleotides. Remember for RNA we're going to change out our T for a U. So the nucleotides come in as the triphosphates, ATP, UTP, CTP, and GTP, and they are going to be pair bonded with their complementary base. RNA polymerase continues until it gets to a special sequence in the DNA that says it's time to fall off. We've finished making the RNA. This is now the transcript to make a protein. So, interestingly, eukaryotic genes, this is only true for eukaryotes, not prokaryotes, the bacteria, um, they tend to have more complicated genes than we, expect, than we um, expected. And the experiment that proves that is going to come up in a minute, but first let's talk about what, what's going on here. So, if you look at the DNA for a gene, it's actually longer than what the final mRNA is to make your protein. And that's because um, it's sort of built in cassettes. So in the DNA, there are things called exons, and then there are things called introns. Um, 
Exxon is going to turn out to be the coding region, so see they keep it in the dark color, so here's the dark green, and that's going to get spliced together to make the final piece of mRNA. Things that get cut out are called introns or intervening sequences, so they are in the way, that might be the way you can remember that. Um, they, these introns turn out to sometimes have some interesting information in them, not all the time, we're still learning about why they're there. Um, they, they still argue about why the introns are there. Um, it could be to slow down the processing of the mRNA. It's a way to control how it's getting released from the nucleus. Um, again, they're, they're kind of fighting about why. Um, so here's just an up close. Here's our promoter. Here's a start codon for our protein that's going to be the AUG. And then here's the first exon. It'll get spliced together here. Second exon comes in the middle. It's going to get spliced together here. And third one here. What thing, one thing that these exons allow you to do is you can sort of cut and paste little cassettes, and you can actually make different proteins. So that is one evolutionary reason why they think they have exons. It allows for diversity in genes. So uh, moving on to uh, just the comparison between eukaryotes and prokaryotes. Remember I said that prokaryotes do not have, um, they don't have any um, introns. So they're missing the introns. Eukaryotes do have the introns. Another thing that the prokaryotes um, don't have is any kind of modification to the mRNA. And you're going to see in a second, after you splice out the introns, there's a cap that goes on the 5' prime side of the RNA and the 3' prime poly A tail. So a whole bunch of A's get added to the end of a mRNA. And then lastly, um, remember eukaryotes have a nucleus, so they start making their mRNA in the nucleus and then they export it out when it's finally finished to the cytoplasm. A prokaryote's just bopping along doing the same thing all at once because it has no nucleus. So how did they find these introns? Well, when people were first isolating genes, they, they actually started with the message, the mRNA, because they had that in the cytoplasm and you can um, directly relate that to the RNA, I'm sorry, the protein sequence. So they were able to sort of guess at what some of the sequences were, and um, people were able to synthesize or build small pieces of um, a DNA sequence knowing that that would kind of match the gene that they're studying. So keep making more sense as the month goes on and we talk about molecular biology techniques, but just take it that now that maybe you know something about a protein you're studying, and you can go backwards and tell me um, what the DNA code is, and I could go synthesize it on a machine. So when you do that in the lab, um, you call this a probe, and it's an incredibly powerful tool, and we'll be dealing with probes a lot in the next couple of weeks as we talk about molecular biology techniques. So one of the experiments that was done with a probe is that they, they labeled this, or they had a way to follow it, and um, then they allowed it to bind some DNA that had been um, melted or separated for this hydrogen bonds. You take basically a target DNA, you heat it up, it falls apart, and then if you mix in your probe, some of the pieces of DNA are going to bind to your probe instead of binding to its other partner, because these can hydrogen bond. So it turns out that we can synthesize these incredibly powerful tools called probes. So what they did to find these exons is that they made a beta globin mRNA probe, so this is some part of hemoglobin, and they um, bound it to DNA, and they found that when they went to genomic DNA, or the DNA that's held in the, in the nucleus, they made these bubbles, and that was their extra material that wasn't binding their mRNA probe. So that's their first clue that they had these um, intron sequences, or these intervening sequences that didn't end up being in the mRNA. And uh, a whole lot of work went on. So how do these intervening sequences get removed? So in the nucleus, there's an area where this processing goes on. And um, there are recognition sites in the intron, so they're actually, you can't tell in the um, final mRNA exactly where it would get spliced. You can't go from here to here and know what's going on. You actually have to go from this way down. So these little um, small nuclear ribonuclear proteins called SNRPs identify these splice sites on the intron. They bring it together in a loop, and now it's called a spliceosome. And it actually cuts the DNA, or the mRNA, and binds it to the other exon. And this happens all over the nucleus. So SNRPs are, are uh, processing your mRNA to a final copy. Then the last two things that have to happen to an mRNA before it can leave the nucleus is this 5' prime cap gets put on. It's actually a backwards guanine. So remember G and GTP and the ATGCs. Puts on a backwards 5' um, prime G. 
and on the tail you put this huge run of ad beads and this is varying again they still are arguing about what the different lengths do they think it might have some message for mRNA stability how long it's going to last in the cell but yeah we, we still don't really know in any event you need to have all this before it can leave the nucleus get out and go into the cytoplasm then lastly I wanted to leave you with the um, the genetic code we've kind of talked a, a smidge about this in some of the sections but um, basically a lot of experiments went on to try to figure out how the DNA or now the RNA codes into proteins so um, if you took uh, remember we have 20 amino acids so if you have um, four nucleotides that doesn't work right so it's got to be more than a one-to-one -one. but what if you had um, you took two of the nucleotides at a time. So maybe UA codes for something, maybe GG codes for something. Um, again, that's not enough to code for all 20 because that's um, four bases um, squared. I can't get a square up here, sorry. Um, four squared is um, only 16, right? So that's only 16 amino acids if you took your nucleotides two at a time. So it turns out that if you take your nucleotides three at a time, four to the third, which doesn't come out like that, um, we have um, 64 possibilities, right? Four times four times four. Um, that's raised to the third. Um, so now we have 64 combinations of triples, and those can cover all of our amino acids. So this is the famous genetic code. It was figured out by a bunch of scientists in the... Um, um, 50s led by Nuremberg and basically he started to make a string of U's in the test tube and found out that every time he had a long string of U's he would get the amino acid phenylalanine um, bound to each other and they did that you can go down here and see uh, let's see where's a string of A's you do all A's in an mRNA you get all lysines um, and so on so there's a couple different ways that you can display the code here's one way if the first letter of the triplet is here the second letter is here, and then the third is here, you can go find your different amino acids, and here's all the 20 different amino acids. Since there are 64 possibilities, we have a lot of cool things you could do with the code. Number one, there can be redundancy, so that means that, look at over here, there's four different ways to code for glycine, and actually there is two more, where is the other glycines? They're not popping out at me. Glycine's one of the ones you can have more. Anyway, uh, arginine is another one. Here is four arginines, and then voila, two more arginines. So there's six ways to code for arginine. Um, you can also have room to have these stop codons. So there are three ways to tell the end of a protein. Anytime you see a UAA, UAG, or UGA, you basically say, okay, you're done making a protein, you're finished. There's a couple that only have one way to code. Methionine is the start codon, so there's only one way to code for that one because you only want to start it once. Turns out tryptophan is only coded for once, but who knows why. The really cool thing about having multiple ways to code for an amino acid is that, look at the arginine. As long as you have a C and a G for the first two, it could be any of the four possible ones to code for this, and you'll still code for arginine. So this is a really cool way to allow for mistakes to happen and not mess up your protein. So this is called wobble or redundancy. And this is the ability of not caring about that third base and still coding for that same amino acid. Now remember, that doesn't happen for all of them, but sometimes it does. I'm feeling like I'm going to be late on time. I'm going to stop here.